The title in the New American Standard Version is, is helpful. God abases the proud but exalts the righteous. What a wonderfully simple contrast. God puts down the proud but he promotes the righteous. That's a theme that we don't do much with because the object, the end game of most Christians going to church is that we go to heaven and do who knows what. No, he promotes the righteous to rule the world, Daniel 7.27. That does sounds a little bit ostentatious, a little bit proud. It's not. It's biblical. He promotes them. Another one by Asaph, a song. He sang about this. Paraphrased versions avoid the literal Hebrew because it's difficult for us. But you can understand in verse 4 that a horn is the image taken from the animal with a horn, obviously. Its strength, its power to attack is involved in the horn. So that's quite clear. That's the world in which this Asaph worked. So we give thanks. Key is giving thanks. I notice in the New Testament, Paul is forever saying, for goodness sake, be thankful. Easy to get there. We're to thank God constantly, despite the tribulation we're going through. For your name is near. And I stop and I think, well, for your name. That would be then the presence of God here. Your name is near. What? How to spell Yahweh? No, no, no. Your name is near. Your presence with me through your spirit. Something like that. Men declare your wondrous works. They do. You can read the scientists, read a lot of good commentary, by the way, the NIV study Bible, a mass of good material. It's not all wrong by any means, and a lot of it is very, very instructive. But men declare your wondrous works, so you meditate on the marvel of creation. I love that verse that we read just recently about God makes morning and evening, summer and winter. Isn't that interesting? We're in this box, aren't we? How many of us can change that? We all go to bed at night, all get up in the morning. We all go through the seasons. I do understand the dose, though. Jesus said, take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, your will be done. This dose that I have to drink. And then you think of the bowls, the final bowls of wrath poured out in the book of Revelation. All we're doing here is connecting verse with verse. It's God's wrath upon the evil nations. Very scary. It's very tough. The imagery is very strong. So uh, we did the thanksgiving in verse 1. When I select an appointed time. It's God's timing here. When I, God, select an appointed time, it is I, God, who judge with equity. So we don't take that judgment into our own hands. Nations do. Kingdoms of this world have killed recently a bad guy. That's not the job of the Christian. That's not your career. That's not what you're supposed to do. Jesus didn't do that. But at the second coming, he's going to say, bring my enemies in front of me and slaughter them. People don't know that verse in Luke 19, 27. Bring my enemies, the ones who didn't want me to be king over them in the kingdom, and slaughter them. What? The vengeance is mine. I will repay. Don't take the law into your own hands now. Very important lesson. In fact, that's what verse 2 says. When I select an appointed time, it is I, the majestic I of God, the single person who will judge with equity. Okay, so now this is the bad scene in Isaiah 24, similar devastating scene. Earth, all who dwell in it are melting. They're melting, are tottering in the margin. It's I who firmly set its pillars. God has got it on pillars. And by the way, the flat earth people should realize that the Bible doesn't offer you a scientific picture of the earth necessarily. When Moses wrote that the birds are flying on the surface of the dome, that's false scientifically. It's a very good picture. Yeah, where are the pillars? Literally, you don't need to get all bent out of shape. So uh, that's the argument I would use against that. So verse 7 is very important to me. God is the judge. Wow. We're in court before God. The Bible is a legal document. Our constitution is not the one that's the constitution of the states, but it is the constitution of the world. And we who dare to get up and try to expand from time to time are trying to give our opinions about the constitution of God, the Bible. I love it. God is the judge. That's rather a good image, isn't it? I don't like that image, but he's the judge. In the second half of verse 7, he puts down one and exalts another, but he does exalt some. And I find in telling people this, they say, oh, poor little me, I'm nothing. Wait a minute. Maybe God is more excited about your talent than you are. He's not putting you through all of this stuff to do nothing with you. He's going to exalt you to give an example and, and to help others. That's where in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, a favorite verse of mine, the church there were fighting about issues in the church, and they were going to law before the pagan courts. And Paul is horrified by that. What? 
Don't you know the saints are going to manage the world? Badly translated as judge. Don't you know? Do you know? Have you fully meditated on this? That the saints are going to manage the world. What? Little old me? Yes, you. So get busy. If God wants to exalt you, let him do it. That's a powerful image there. Eight. The God of Jacob. Wonderful. The God of David. The God of Jacob. The God of Abraham. The God of Jesus. Wow. How can Jesus be God if he has a God? That's just nonsense. You've got two gods in that sentence. This isn't so hard once you see it. Okay, so nine, as for me now, Asaph, the psalm writer, I will declare it forever. What is the it there? Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down the dregs, the cup, the dose of punishment, we might say. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. As for me, verse 9, and all the horns of the wicked, the image from the animal with the strength of its attacking horns, God will cut all of those off eventually. He will absolutely demote them, not promote them. And the horns of the, oh, the horns of the righteous, the strength of the right people, the good people, will be lifted up, raised up. 